please kneel as we begin the service. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing our call to worship. This is your house. As we gather in this place today, Holy Spirit, come and have your way, have your way. As we lay aside our own desires, sweep across our hearts with holy fire. This is your house, your home. We welcome you, Lord, we welcome you. This is your house, your home. We welcome you today. We welcome you today. Lord, we welcome you. Today. Heavenly Father, truly we welcome you today, the day you sanctioned and set apart, and gave to us that we might remember that you are both our creator and our savior and redeemer. Father, what will we do with the opportunities that you lay out before us? How will we share? What story will our lives tell? Father, I pray that you'd be with us today. Your spirit would abide with us. Our thoughts, our minds, our actions would be in alignment with you. And this would be our story from now until you come back. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, so glad you guys are here today on this Easter. Well, Easter is tomorrow, but it's still good. <laughs> So, um, yeah, the Lord is so amazing, isn't he? So we should give everything that we have to him, especially our hearts. And he is worthy of everything. So let's just sing, worthy is the Lamb.
So every day we should say to ourselves, Lord, change my heart. We don't say it enough. At least I know I don't. So just please think about what we are singing and sing it with everything that you have. So this is the part of the service where we go and greet each other. Let everybody know how happy you are to see them. Let's sing the family song.
please let us stand as we sing our opening song, He is Lord. church. All right. It's time to welcome our visitors and everybody to church. Uh, happy Sabbath. Um, we want to welcome also those people who are worshiping with us on the internet. I have a few names here today. Uh, when I call you, you can just raise your hand and we want to recognize you. Okay. Melissa Van C. All right. We're glad you are here today. Uh, we have a small token. She is from Brooklyn, New York. All right. Um, Melissa. I also have Vanessa Van C. Okay. She's also from Brooklyn. We're glad you're here today. All right. Then we have. Uh, think is correct me please Ellie Davy and Sue Tripp Tripp oh okay and you are where are you visiting us from all right you know another Virginian please church members we like to greet you put your rounds uh, your hands around them you know we're glad you are here and we pray that you come back and see us again if we don't see here again, we pray that we meet in heaven. So, all right. Thank you. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. You guys should know the pastor did make it safely to Huntsville, Alabama. I uh, spoke to him yesterday or day before. I said, I'm calling to pray for you to, when you're traveling, Mercy. He said, I'm here already, brother. So, <laughs> so uh, praise God. And he uh, texted me this morning early and said he was praying for me and by extension for you guys as well. So I wanted you to know that. Uh, just a few uh, short announcements that he would want to share. And I'm looking at it on my phone as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just so you're aware, uh, we're having prayer meeting every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, the topic and theme is the miracles of Jesus, so please come out. Uh, and I know some of us come from far away, but even if you get a half an hour or 15 minutes, come on out and enjoy the fellowship on Wednesday. Next slide, please. I think two, actually. Yeah. So this is the prayer list. The pastor keeps a running prayer list. Uh, I hope you're paying attention and praying for our members. And um, if you know someone that needs to be added to this list, please let him know. I think there's actually one more page. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll stay in prayer. Actually, there's three pages, so the list is growing. A few upcoming events. Uh, I think it's two slides. 
Uh, as you know, uh, the Pathfinders have been planning for Oshkosh. I'm so glad to see that line moving up. I was thinking to myself a couple weeks ago, I said, is that still down at zero? Is that a mistake? So praise God. I'm assuming that we got, I don't see, oh, Sister Sandra, I'm assuming that some funds came in from the play. I want to especially thank Sister Sharon and the leadership that put together that play. I was blessed in just hearing those lines again and the leadership that was provided by Sister Sharon, pulling us all together. Thank you for what you did. May God bless you for that. But it was a blessing. Yep. Let's give her a round of applause. Along those lines, the theme of God's hand is on our young people. The next slide shows you that, of course, our um, Bible team has got first place. They will be going to Florida. Praise God for them. Praise God for them. I mean, success is all over them. God is with them. Uh, on April 14th, we'll be having church on the lawn. That's outdoor church. I like that theme, though, church on the lawn. And so we're looking forward to that. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. I believe that is for potluck. Uh, yep, okay, I'm getting a nod for that. So please come out. Uh, we're praying it'll be a good day and warm. I know you people are thinking, man, it's going to be cold. Don't pray for that. Pray for a nice warm day, okay? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, on the 21 uh, back, please. Or did we miss one? Okay. Uh, one back, I think. Yeah. So on the 21st, we'll have Michael Harris in concert. Um, I think he's also having the service, him and his wife, that morning. So come out. You'll be blessed by that. And next slide. Man, I'm so excited for our young people. They're just first place all over. I mean, God is blessing them. Praise God for them. Praise God for what they did. And so they're Florida bound as well. Man, I wish I was a young person in this church. You guys are... Guys are doing awesome things. Praise God for you. Next slide. Uh, if Brother Johnny Carmouche could raise his hand, uh, he is our prison ministry leader. We still need volunteers for Sunday. I, I'll say also we could really use some volunteers to go out to the prisons. It's, it's three of us, and he's opening up new prisons and jails through God's help every single day. And so, well, that's a little exaggeration, but we are opening up new prisons. So we need people, and please see him if you'd like to come out. And I think that concludes the announcements. Praise God. Be praying for me as I pray for you. And pray for our pastor to make it back here safely, please. Okay, it's time for the lamb's offering. This is when the young people comes around. Take the basket. Please dig deep. And this is for... TLC Prep Scholarship Fund. Uh, kids, go and get your basket and make sure you go into the rows and everything. Okay? After this, uh, we're going to have the children's story by Raquel Manso.
Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's a beautiful day. I'm going to tell you a story today about a girl that I met when I was in India. It's a true story. I changed some of the names, but the girl's name I kept, okay? All right. But I want to ask you a question. Do you think that Jesus is special? Yes. Why? Because he's a God. Yeah. Yeah. He can make wonderful things. You're right. He's awesome. Okay. So I want to share a short story that I think you will enjoy about Jesus and why I think he's special. Okay? All right. Rupa, she's a real, a real girl. Okay? And I think there's a picture up there of Rupa. Rupa is the girl that's in the center. Okay? Rupa was our translator. Rupa is a teacher. And she went to an Adventist school where I went when I visited India. Rupa is, um, and her friend Vanesh live in a small town called Trinchi. Okay? Every Sabbath, Vanesh and Rupa go out to the nearby village and share the word of God with people in that village. And they pray with them and tell them about Jesus and how he loves them. Okay, this is the next slide. Okay, so these are some of the children that live in that village. They're children just like you, okay? And I used to be a child, now I'm an older person. But they love Jesus too, and they're learning about Jesus. In Trinchy, the people do not know God and who Jesus is and how special he is. Unfortunately, they just follow a different God, but they're learning, okay? They're learning about Jesus. Do you, do you think it is important for everyone to know who Jesus is? Why? Because he does miracles. He does miracles, yes, he does. And why else? Um, he can raise people from the dead. He can raise people from the dead like Lazarus, right? And he made us. That's the most special thing. Yeah. And he loves us, right? Okay. One Saturday, a boy named Kumar saw Rupa and Vanesh return very happy. And he wanted to know why they were so happy. Rupa told him that she and Vanesh had been invited to give Bible classes to a family who wanted to know more about Jesus. And that's very hard in India because not everybody knows about Jesus. So it would make anyone happy that would want to share the message about Jesus. Kumar asked if he could join them the following week. Rupa, a little surprised about the request, said yes to Kumar, because Kumar used to always make fun about why she, what she was doing. But she said, yes, of course, you can come with, it, with us. The following week, Rupa, Vanesh, and Kumar set out to another village. And um, Rupa and Vanesh prayed for God's protection and safety. And en route to the village, they came across some guards. They, they were stopped. And they wanted to know what they were doing because they had bags with books, you know, Bibles and things like that. Next slide. And um, anyway, they, they were stopped and Rupa and Vanesh started to pray silently, and um, they were asking God to please help them and keep them safe, and at the same time, they were asking that the guard that was talking to them would, um, his heart would be softened to, to them, towards them. But Kumar, he didn't pray. Kumar got scared. And Kumar kind of started taking a step back and moving away from the guards and slowly moving away. And when he got a chance, he started running away. Okay? He didn't have the same faith that Rupa had and Vanesh. So while Rupa and Vanesh were praying, the guard stopped for a minute and he asked them, well, what, what, what are you doing? And Rupa said, well, we're sharing with the people what we know about Jesus. 
And then the guard gave them back their identifications and said, go ahead, you can go. And he wished them well. When Rupa and Vanesh returned uh, to their homes, Kumar was outside and was surprised to see them and asked him what had happened. And these are some of the people that Rupa and myself uh, met with and they're learning about Jesus and they were praying. And if you see the little children there, even the little children are praying. And that's really special because they're three and four and five year old children and they're learning just like you all in your Sabbath schools about Jesus. Um, Kumar, he was outside, he was surprised to see them be so happy and asked him, well, what happened? What happened with the guard? And Rupa just told him, we prayed and God answered our prayer. And in Psalms 91, 11, and 12, it says, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. And verse 12 says, they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And in Isaiah 41.10, it says, so don't worry because I am with you. Don't be afraid because, because I am your God. I will make you, you strong and I will help you. I will support you with my right hand that saves you. So Rupa and Vanesh told Kumar that they felt safe in Jesus and why they believe that he is special. So if you look at the slide here on the left side, it's in English, I did it in Spanish for those that look to read Spanish. Uh, Jesus saves us, right? Yes? Yes, of course. And Jesus, he answers prayers, right? Okay, when we pray, he answers prayers. And Jesus forgives us when we ask for forgiveness, right? Yes. And it, Jesus is our perfect example. Okay? So whenever you're going out to talk to someone about Jesus or whenever you're going to do something that you know that will help others learn about Jesus, if you pray, God will keep you safe. Okay? All right. Would someone like to pray? Come. You, you can come too. Come. I know you like to pray too. Okay. He's going to go first, okay? Okay. Go ahead. Dear Lord, help us through this day. Help everyone at, that's here and help everyone else. Amen. Amen. Okay. And, okay. You, you can go to. You, you want to pray too? Okay, she wants to pray? Okay, go ahead. Dear Lord, thank you for him, and thank you for everybody around us, and thank you for everybody. Amen. 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 Jesus, thank you um, for Sarah's and, and keeping us safe. And keeping us safe. And, and happy Easter. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Rick Quirrell, for that mission story. It's time for... It's time for a garden of prayer. In this church, at this time, we ask if you want to come to the front, you have something special you want to make a supplication, you can come to the front. And others in the congregation, you can kneel down with us while we seek the Lord in prayer. While people are coming, to the front, we want to let you know that uh, God told us to, he goes to prepare a place for us. He said we should believe in him and he's coming back for sure. So let us seek the Lord in prayer. Merciful God and Father, loving us. 
us like no other. Hear our prayer, the cry of our hearts as we This time we pray for forgiveness of sins, for everything we could have done throughout the week, intentionally and not knowing. We pray for the forgiveness of all our sins, Lord, because sins separate us from you. We just pray that you forgive us every single person here and those people worshiping with us on the internet. Father, Lord. We bring this congregation to you that you continue to be with us so that we can serve you in our community, especially here in Fredericksburg. Be with every member. Equip us, help us to really deliver this message individually, corporately, and as families, Lord, we pray. At this time, we bring the whole, the church body to you, the general conference. Be with this church as it takes this message to the world, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit to guide them. We pray for our world. We pray for the leaders of every nation. We pray that you continue to guide and help us. The world is really becoming a very, very, very troubled place. But we believe in you. And we pray that you be with every single person of us and guide us through. At this time, Lord, we bring all voices to you. The request that the people that come to the front and those that might be kneeling in the congregation, those that they have a voice, it could be for finance, it could be for discouragement, it could be for children, whatever it is, Lord, we just pray that you help us. I'm going to pause a little bit and just let the congregation and the people in the front to just... raise their voices to you. Merciful God, we know you've heard us 
and we just pray that you answer us according to your will. At this time, we pray for the sick, for special prayer. We thanks for Sister Gladys. Uh, we thanks for the jury checks. We thank for the members who are sick, who are back at home. And we have all those lists of people who are sick. We pray that you touch them in your mighty way and heal them. We would like to see them back. We thank you for the people that come and worship with us today, Lord. You get them back home safely. And Heavenly Father, we pray for our brother who's going to break the word today for us. We pray that the Holy Spirit will touch his tongue and that he may preach to us what you sent from heaven. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. May the blessing of today be on each one of us and our families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is coming from Luke chapter 22, verse 24. I mean, 42, I'm sorry. When you have it, please say amen. 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 Okay. Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Never, nevertheless, not my will, but thou be done. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. have a special music from Brother Carl Michael Camacho. Good morning again and happy Sabbath. It's been said, and I think, Brother Bill, I'm agreeing with it as I live a little bit. It's been said that some of the most beautiful things are birthed out of a place of some of our greatest losses and some of our greatest pains. And, and I think 
Case in point, Lizzie, is brother Thomas Dorsey. Thomas Dorsey lived in the 1920s. He was a musician in the mid to late 1920s, and he worked the Chicago nightclub scene. He was pretty good. And Brother Dorsey, subsequent to his experiences in Chicago, gave his life to Christ. He surrendered himself. Brother Jason, he said, I'm going to give it all to Christ. And Brother Carmichael, he gave his musician skills, his musical talents to Christ as well. And in 1932, he was asked to be the lead musician, Brother Jim, in a revival in St. Louis. He's from Chicago. He wanted to be in this revival in St. Louis. And he was hesitant to go, Sister Nancy. He didn't want to go. And he didn't want to go particularly because his young wife was expecting their first child. So he didn't want to travel far away. He consulted with his wife, Shay. He talked to her and he prayed. He talked to God. And they decided that probably it was the right thing to do, Brother Johnny. He would go and take care of God's business and God would take care of his family, Elder Jones, back home. So it was okay. It was a, it was a good deal. Well, two weeks into the revival, he received a letter, a telegram actually, and the telegram said simply this, you have a son, Brother Josh, but your wife did not make it through childbirth. She passed. Come back right away. So he did. He came back right away. He got back just in time to hold his infant son, Sister Marion, in his arms, and it wasn't an enduring hold, though, because a few hours later, that infant son also passed away. One son gone, one wife gone, buried on the same day in the same casket. He was despondent, he was frustrated, he was angry. He thought to himself, while I was taking care of your business, who was taking care of my family? And at the height of his anger, he said the following. I'm hesitant to repeat it, but I should in the interest of telling you what happened. He said, God, at this point, you're not worth a dime to me. He was angry. Two weeks later, still despondent, still depressed, he sat at a very familiar place, Brother Carmichael. He sat in front of his piano, and he said the words just came to him, the words in a melody. And he began to pen the following song. Some of you may know it. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way goes drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears and the night draws near, and the past and the day is past and gone, at the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand. Take my hand, Lord, lead me home. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am lone. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunities. Sometimes we get distracted in the details, but Father, there's an opportunity while the world is focused afresh on your life, your ministry, but specifically your resurrection. You are a living God. Father, may our lives preach a sermon. May our words be careful and consistent and thoughtful and steeped in the counsel of your heavenly word so that someone who's paying attention to all the fuss around these next couple of days will get to know you through our example. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you would, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Luke chapter 11 and start at verse 1. While you're turning there, uh, it's so amazing if you have the opportunity. Some of these songs that have been written throughout the years, they come from a real personal story. And this is one. I don't know how many of you knew that, but if you listen to those words with the story in mind, you hear afresh some of the things that were birthed out of his pain. God reached him where he was and used his gift to do so. But turn with me to Luke, if you will. We'll... Go to chapter 11. We're probably going to spend a little bit of time there if that's okay today. I'm going to read a little bit. I'll begin at verse 1. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And the word says the following. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, 
Teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Teach us to pray, they said. And they referenced John. It seems they had probably heard some goodness in what John was praying here. Luke is a writer of great specific details. He gives details throughout the word. It's, it's interesting because I always look for the details when I'm trying to unpack a sermon. What happened? Why did it happen? What's the context? What's the chronology? Well, Luke, who's very specific, doesn't give chronology here. He also doesn't give location. Those are things I like to look at so I can say, oh, man, you know, what all is in the message here? What can I learn? What can I share? He does, he does share the specifics of the exchange, though. And I think what he shares is 100% worth considering this morning. So we'll consider that. We won't look at all the context and all the homiletics. We'll just consider what was said. I think it's worth consideration. What do we know? Let's, let's focus on that. Sometimes as Adventists, we, we're really smart. You guys are really smart. You guys are, you study God's word. And sometimes we get in long, lengthy conversations about what we don't know, what we think we know. Let's focus today on what we do know. I think we can reasonably consider a couple things. Jesus was praying, right? That, that's simple. It was probably out loud. It was probably audible. Why do I say that? Because a single vocal disciple who seemingly spoke on behalf of the group said after the prayer, Jesus, teach us to pray. So those things we can know with pretty good certainty without having to go any further than that. After having, I'm, I'm kind of reasoning here, after having observed the prayer life of Jesus, not just on this day, but throughout his ministry, but I think this was the pinnacle, something came to them. He is praying different. It's not what we're used to hearing. So that vocal disciple, I don't know, was it Peter, was it James, was it John? I don't know. The text doesn't say. It's interesting that Luke doesn't give those details. After having observed Jesus' prayer life, they noticed one thing. It was different than what they have heard from the, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes. It was not what they had been observing every day. I like the, the commentary puts it this way. I love this phraseology. It says this. They observed a communion of intimacy. Can you wrap your minds around that? That's what the commentary says, a communion of intimacy. Jesus, if you will, if, if you'll allow me, Jesus talking with his heavenly father as does one friend with another. And that's not what they had been hearing. So Matt, who's your closest friend? Don't yell out loud, but I mean, I'm talking about the one you love and respect more than anybody else. The one you can share all your secrets with. Maybe gone to war with Elder Jones, Elder Maloney. That friend you haven't talked to in years, but you pick up the phone and the conversation continues as if it never ended. The one you respect. The moment, Sister Bajor, you share moments of candor with. Who is that friend? Who is that person? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure the disciples had a friend like that. Somebody they thought about it, said, man, that's, he's talking to my father like I talk to my best friend. And so they observe that Jesus had that kind of friendship with the Father. That's, that's amazing to me. It was evidenced by trust and familiarity. It's how they communicated. He and the Father. Commentary says something else. There's some really neat notes on this. Commentary says, and I'm kind of cutting it in between, as they listen, this is the disciples, as they listen to the manner in which Jesus prayed, intimately communing with his heavenly father as one friend does with another. They had not heard that. The idea of someone talking to God in a very personal way, in a way of confidence. You know, we all have friends, right? See, I struggle. I'm an introvert. So to expect me to have small talk or intermingle in a crowd, I'm not good at that. But my friends, somebody that I know, we talk, man, we can pick right up. We can share. And that's what they noticed. They notice that. It appears that they long for it as well. They wanted what he had. They wanted what Jesus had, a communion of friendship, trust, and intimacy with the Father. And it's interesting to me, they reference, I didn't, I didn't touch on it, I think maybe shortly, they reference to kind of teach us as John did his disciples, which maybe makes you think it might be Peter or someone, but they must have noticed some things about how John and his disciples were praying differently too. There was a relationship paradigm shift going on. And so it wasn't as if, uh, Elder Carmouche, that they were unfamiliar with the exercise of prayer. They heard many prayers. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Let's see the kind of prayers they heard. Matthew 6, verse 5. We'll start there. They heard many prayers. People praying all the time. 
Prayer was not a new concept. This is Jesus talking. We're, we're, we're midstream. He's talking a lot about prayer and requests here. But we'll pick up midstream. And when thou prayest, Jesus is speaking, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. He talks a lot about prayer there. He talks about prayer from a contrast, not a compare perspective. And what he's saying is, that's not the kind of prayer I'm calling you to. I'm calling you to something a little more personal. But the prayers of the master, it seems, were much different, much more powerful. I don't think it was different in intonations or tones or theological words. I don't think that was it. The commentary says something else cool that I thought was interesting, and I'm quoting here specifically because I don't want to mess this up. The prayers they heard were different than anything else they had ever heard. This is referencing right before they asked. It wasn't just a little different. It was completely different. So much so the disciples just thought if they could pray like the master, their ministry would be much more effective, meaningful, powerful. That's what they thought. They said, if I can just connect like that, then my ministry will be powerful. That's a meaningful thought. I think that's a good thought for today. And I think that happened, right? We see, it's interesting to see the, how the change with the disciples' ministry occurred after Acts, the second chapter, when the Holy Spirit fell on them. Uh, these same men who were kind of meek or loud at the wrong time or quiet at the wrong time, they were different. Remember when, when uh, James or uh, Peter and John were walking up and the man was begging alms and Peter didn't stop and say, he just said, I don't have silver and gold, but such as I have in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. They had a power. And Jesus referenced that. Write this down, John 14, 12. He said they would do greater things than what he was doing once they connected with him because he would be with the Father. But back to this heartfelt request, because it stunned me when I first read it. it. It stopped me in my tracks. The request of the disciple, Jesus, teach us to pray. He's speaking for the collective. I don't know if they talked about it, but they came to a conclusion jointly that at that point was the apex where they said, we don't know how to pray. Sometimes the challenge with us as Christians walking with God is we don't learn anything new because we think we already know it. In their moments of vulnerability, those were the powerful moments in the, in the ministry of the disciples. Teach us to pray. Brother, sister, is that a meaningful request for you and I today? Can we still learn how to pray? Can we still learn how to reach out to God in a more meaningful way? So it occurs to me there's probably many reasons why you and I pray. A lot of times they take the form of a specific request, right? I need something. Someone close to me needs something. And so health, finances, the right job, the right car, the right spouse, or even relief for some kind of persecution. We prayed with a sister this week on the job who was just being persecuted on the job. Man, as I was listening, I was like, I don't know what I would do in that position. She needs the job, but her boss is treating her terribly. And I think there is so much that is right with a loving son, a daughter, coming before an ever-loving, ever-kind, ever-giving father saying, I need your help. I can't do it. I think we're in a good place when we get there. Can we go back to Luke for a second? Let's, uh, let's Luke 11, let's traverse down to verse 5 because Jesus does something amazing here that I'd like us to look at. Again, Luke 11, and we'll, I think we might start at verse 5 here. Um, And he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, Yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. This is one of these problem texts when you really study it, right? Because our 
habit when we study is to find God in the text, right? And so normally, God is the one who is offering the gift. God is the one who's making the request. So we go, we look at this and we say, this is a problem text because this person who's getting a request doesn't sound like a God I know. That can't be right. Well, if you drew that conclusion, a thoughtful study will let you know that that is correct. That is not God. It is not a compare. It's a contrast to who God is. But this is where divine genius meets divine opportunity. Because Jesus leading up here, remember, let's see what's happened before, right? Jesus is praying. The disciples know he's praying. They recognize that. They recognize the differences. It finally clicks in their head. Mm, this is different. This is not what we're used to. So Jesus, if we were to read back in Luke, you would see that right after that, he gives, him, he gives them what? When they, he say, they say, teach us to pray, what does Jesus give them? The Lord's Prayer. He gives them a wonderful, authentic template for how to pray. And it's very simple and it's very structured and it's very powerful. Then on the heels of that, he begins to unpack a very powerful object lesson. Not one of compare, but one of contrast. So that's what's leading up to the text. So let's consider, let's look at the people in the text. What about the man asking, right? It's two points I want you to notice. Did you notice who he was asking for? Who noticed? He had a friend coming in. It wasn't for himself. So that's number one. He was interceding on behalf of a friend. He was going to the other guy who had resources. Say, I got a friend coming. Look, in the Middle East, you guys, some of us been there. They normally traveled at night because it was so hot during the day. It is stifling hot. I know when I was in Iraq and we would be riding in the Humvees before they had those uh, MRAPs and everything. We had the zippers on the windows and we would roll down the windows. It felt like somebody was putting a blow dryer in your face. It was so hot. You might as well roll them up and you're in full gear, you know, neck straps, helmets. It's hot there. So normally they traveled at night. So likely he'd been traveling all night, which made sense. When the guy said, hey, I don't want to wake all my children up and get these. Remember, in the homes, everything was compartmentalized. You didn't have like everybody didn't have their own room and TV and all that stuff. So it was it was a bit of a stressor there. So we see that the man is interceding on behalf of someone else and he realizes something key here. I don't realize this enough. He had nothing to offer the man. Nothing. Not even a crumb. He just asked for three loaves. Two things he immediately realized, and this is what I think, this is what occurred to me with new clarity, maybe not enough. I think you and I, I'll just stick with me, I need to get to the place where I realize I have nothing of heavenly value to offer anyone. I don't care about degrees. I don't care about how long I've been an Adventist. The only thing I have to offer for someone who doesn't know Christ is an introduction to the master who changed my own life. That's what I have to offer. This man immediately recognized. He said, I don't have anything. And remember, he asked for three loaves, right? Bread. So there's some symbology here. Who is the bread of life? Jesus. He had nothing to offer. He's interceding on behalf of someone else. He didn't say. He could have said, I got nothing for you. But we know somebody. That's true. He had nothing for him. But he didn't stop there. Sometimes we want to give great advice or wisdom and show how smart. I'm, I'm a big, I do this a lot. In midstream, I'm, I'm thinking, be quiet. Be quiet and listen. Be quiet and listen. See the opportunity to introduce God into the situation instead of putting yourself there when all, with all your so-called wisdom or so. John 15, 5, I quote that often. Probably maybe some say too much. Right. You guys know the text. Right. Jesus said, I'm the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do what? Nothing. You know, why I quote it so much because I need to remember it. Every time I accomplish something, I struggle with thinking, man, I'm, I made it. I've arrived. So now I can offer something. And, and can I offer things? Yes. In the context of my loving relationship with the father, I certainly can. But apart from him, he says, I can do nothing. So I think I quote it often because it's not applied often enough in my own life and context. So Jesus then focuses on a friend, the three loaves of bread. We see that. And so this is what happens next. This is the problem text. How does that friend respond? Is he like, yes, I'm so glad you came to me at midnight and asked for three loaves of bread? No. Why are you bugging me? You know, my kids are asleep. We're asleep. It's nighttime. 
You knew you had a friend coming. Why didn't you prepare? Anybody ever thought like that? So when somebody asks you, you're beginning to think somebody is often somebody close. I begin to think, why do you handle that, son? Is he listening? I hope not. So why, do you, why are you coming to me now? You could have took care of that. If you asked me three weeks ago, I could have helped you out. Right? So that's what this guy, he's thinking, uh-uh. Now eventually, because the guy keeps coming, he gives. He says, oh, I got to give. Okay, I got to get rid of you. So I want you to go away. I want you to go away. And so that's not God, though. Jesus is doing not a compare here, but he's doing a contrast. That is not who God is. We're going to get the text to kind of bear that out. So, brother, sister, where did this idea of a grumpy old divinity come from? God is just grumpy and doesn't really want to help. We got to stay down on our knees for 30 hours just to get one response because he really doesn't want to help us. Where did this idea come from? Can I be candid with you? So... I think sometimes it comes from the responses of self-professed Christians when we're asked for help. Somewhere along the line, we've been convinced that we got to convince God to help us. We got to, God, you, I know you really don't want to do it, but I need your help. And so we project that to other people sometimes. But Jesus is saying, that's not who my father is. Now, it may be that what you're asking for isn't in your best interest. But that's another story. But let's go to the text to bear that out. Let's, let's stay in Luke a little bit. We're going to go down and read the text we didn't read. Still in um, chapter 11. And we will pick up, I think, at verse 11. But let me see here. Make sure I got it right. Yeah, we'll pick up at verse 11. Chapter 11, Luke, verse 11. This is who the Father is. This is where the contrast comes in. See, we've got to study beyond just one or two texts so we get the full totality of what's being said. And Jesus is still the speaker. He's saying, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? And this is the key text. This ties it all together. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? So that's what he's saying here. Now, if you, can, if you can give to your son, and sometimes we don't, if you can do it being inherently evil apart from a close walk with God, then how much more will your heavenly father give to you? This is not who the father is, is what he's saying here. So a few points that I think we should consider. Maybe say what you're saying, say it again, and sit down and let you guys go eat. A few points we're saying. Point number one. And this, I struggle with this. I struggle with this. I'm just being transparent. You guys probably don't, but I do. God, our Father, does not need to be persuaded or cajoled into doing something good for us that he otherwise would be unwilling or, un, or reluctant to do. You get what I'm saying there? He, we don't need to, you know, if, you, if I just say it a different way, he'll do it. I like what Isaiah says, you know, uh, and it shall come to pass. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. You know what I see in my mind when I embody that with the, t with the text and the theme? I see a God leaning forward into our requests, changing those requests to what we really need. I don't see him standing back saying, mm -mm -mm, go, go away. I don't want that. He doesn't need to be persuaded to help us. Maybe we need to be persuaded to adjust our requests, possibly, Let's turn to the scripture. I don't want to give you my opinion. Ephesians 3.20. Let's give good text for what we're saying, who we're saying God is. We're in safe ground when we do that, I think. Ephesians 3 is a very familiar text. I'd I probably ask anybody out there to read it, and they could. <clears throat> and the word goes on to say this. This is one of my favorites. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. I'll continue to read. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Man, he is able to do way more. I can think a lot, sometimes too much. And this says he can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. That's a lot. He is wanting to do for us what we need. And I'm, I'm glad for that. I'm glad for that. Point number two, we'll keep it simple. Prayer, and I love this point too. These are, these are points to me. So you guys are just getting them because I thought them out loud and wrote them down and you guys are just getting them. Prayer is not so much a matter of it's persuading God to accept our will in a matter as it is 
us being in alignment with his will. Did you get what I'm saying there? Well, God, if you just do this and I already planned this thing out, I've packaged it nice and neat, put a bow tie on it for you, Brother Claude. Now I want you to just bless off on it. I know sometimes I approach prayer that way. I've got it. I've got the solution. It's ready. And then time and relationship and prayer. And the Bible says there's safety in a multitude of counselors among you. Something somebody says gets me to know that, you know what? That's not where I'm supposed to be. God doesn't want me there. Take that thing back, unwrap it, <laughs> give him the empty box and let him fill it. Let him fill it. You guys know Philippians 2.5. Let's go there to get an idea. That's another one of my favorite memory texts. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you. It says so much here. We don't have time to study it all out, but we'll look at it. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in a fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That idea of taking on the mind of Christ, that's, that's, a, that's a powerful idea. It says a lot because it gives us insight into his mind. When he says, took upon the form of a servant, that word in the Greek is translated doulos. It doesn't just mean servant, it means slave. He became a slave on behalf of you and I. And so when we understand that, when we live in that, when we take that mindset on, when we say that his obedience was, I'm going to die on behalf of those who the Father and I love, when we function in that mode, we have a message to tell people during a period where the world is looking at the fact that Jesus lived and died and praise God, he was resurrected. He's living. Amen. The message is not on the day the world begins to look and say, oh, this is when Jesus was resurrected. The message isn't for just the first Sunday of April. The message is formed all year long through our relationship, our walk, our study, our ministry. And then when people go, well, what do you believe? You could give them a sermon on Ishtar and all that, and that's good information, and you, maybe you want to share that, or you can talk to them about what Jesus, the living Jesus, has done in your life. It's up to you, I guess. So, the preeminent characteristic of a slave, back to Philippians 2.5, the most important aspect of being a slave is unwavering, Obedience, doing exactly what the master asks you to do. If you're a good slave, just doing what you need to do. No questions asked, no feedback unnecessarily, just do what you're asked. I struggle with that sometimes, do you? Paul got it, Paul got it. He used that terminology a lot, just being a slave to the gospel. He, he understood that, he functioned in that motif. And so the son of man... And you know, Jesus refers to himself most often in that terminology, the son of man. The son of man chose to be a slave on our behalf. The Bible seems to indicate and commentary says that we may never fully understand that throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Other than it was love focus. God knows what we want. He knows we have desires. He also knows, and I'm glad for this. Time bears us out. He knows what's in our best interest. Like, who's a mom or dad, right? Sometimes your young person asks for something they think is great. And I know this seems oversimplified, but it's not. Apply it to your complicated issue at the job or in your marriage or in your relationship with your kids. Apply it there, right? And so he knows what's in the best interest, but sometimes he holds it back because he wants you to wait, continue to seek, continue to grow. And I think that's okay. It's hard in the application, you know, I, I heard this as a Christian coming in. I'm still not quite sure I get it, why the focus is here and why it's not simpler enough even for me. But I hear people say, you know what? I just want to know God's will for my life. Like it's some cryptic, you know, maze you got to figure out, you know. Go here and go there. I just, how complicated can it be? But when I hear my Christian friends talk, I start thinking, well, I might need to think this thing through a little more because, you know, it might not be that simple, right? So I don't know. I think God knows what his will is for us, number one. I don't think, like, I mean, you know what your will is for your sons and daughters who have parents, right? And so every chance you get, you share it, right? 
And you sometimes you get wise, you know, probably wiser than me, and you find creative ways to share it when they become adults because they don't they tune you out. So you gotta figure out different ways to do it. But everything you're doing is on behalf of them. You know each of your kids are all different. You gotta come a different way with each one. And as they get older, you can see where they're tuning you out. So you try to find a way. But your desire is to share that will. Sometimes their desire is not to hear it. Click. Does that happen with you and I, with God's will? We hear it, we know it, but we reason and rationalize our way out of it. Sometimes I might think we do that. I don't believe for one second that it's cryptic or hard to determine. I like what Matthew 6.33 says, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I like that because if I start with the seeking and I know him, then all those things will fall in place. Either he'll grant me what I need Or he'll change my desire for those things I think I need. I don't need him anymore. I'm not even praying about those things anymore. Because he has transformed my life and I'm allowing him to do so. I'm allowing him to do so. Point number three. I saved this one for last because it's a hard one, I think. I haven't figured out yet how to to work through this uh, in the long term. But I'll share it. Anxiety regarding our situation, I mean consistent, enduring anxiety, is an indication for us, it can let us know something, that we are depending on ourselves more than we are God. You still anxious about things with the same level of anxiety? You just, ah, I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm going to do this, and then I'll do that, and and this and that fails over and over again. And your anxiety amps up more and more and more. Well, there's a message in the word, Philippians 4, 6. Let's turn there. I like this text, too. I got to be reminded of this. This is one of my favorite memory texts, too. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Man, that's, that's powerful. Do you know that word careful is used another place in the Bible? It's used with Mary and Martha when uh, Jesus is coming to eat and Martha's laying at his feet. And, I mean, Mary's laying at his feet and Martha's all anxious because Mary is chilling while she's preparing the feast and the dinner. And so he says to Martha at some point, you're careful about many things. It's only really one you need to worry about. The good part. The good part. And that word careful means a high level of anxiety. Martha was type A. So I can relate with Martha. I'm type A. If I do A, B, C, and D, it's going to work out right. And I don't want anybody coming off my plan. You on my if I make if I'm if I'm sitting back, it's okay. But if I make the plan and you sign up, man, you signed up. You followed me. Right? My wife's laughing because she's like, mm-mm. <clears throat> that plan ain't good no more, right? And that's the carefulness that Martha has. It wasn't a bad thing. Martha's organized. She's squared away. She's got the meal ready. But Jesus is saying, it's a good part that you're missing. While you're in the kitchen, Mary gets the good part. Let the anxiety go. Be careful, I like that, for nothing. But in everything, bring it to God with prayer. In everything. I like that. Make your request known. It was one of my early visits to the Fredericksburg Church. I was sitting back in the back there, um, maybe right where Brother Don is sitting. And I was a new person. You guys were foreigners to me then. Uh, it's probably about 11 years ago. I don't think my wife had even made it down yet. They were still in Maryland. And so I heard from up front, uh, maybe two or three visits in, that there was a deacon in a church. Name will go on said. It's not a negative. But uh, it was a deacon in a church, and he was sick with cancer and that maybe somebody would like to go out and visit him. So I was new. I didn't have any position. It was a nice time. I didn't have any position or a lot of stuff going on. And so I said, I'm just going to go visit the brother. I had seen him once or twice. So I did. I started visiting him. I thought to myself, you know, self, you can go out there and pray with him. You'll encourage him, and you'll really motivate him, and it'll be a great thing, self. That's what I said to myself. That was my self-talk. That's not what happened, though. I got there, and I didn't encourage him as much as he did me. Uh, He shared with me some wonderful things. And you know what I remember? We had a lot of conversations in a short period of time. He never seemed anxious. He never seemed focused on what was a pending 
you know, end of life situation. And I visit a lot of sick people, so this is informed before that and after. This is informed by a lot of visits and maybe a small bit of discernment. I don't think he was praying for the sickness to go away at that point. I don't think he was praying for an extension of life. He was just praying that his relationship would grow. And every time he talked about Jesus coming, I believed him. He, he believed that. He latched on to that. He was walking with God. He was cheerful. He was kind. But he never seemed anxious. Maybe he was in his quiet moments, but he was smiling. You know, it left an impression on me. He talked of seeing Jesus face to face as if it was truly the next thing he would see. Not just in a sermon or in a lesson or some catchphrase. No, no, no. He was about to die. You understand me? And he meant it. And I sensed it. And it changed my life. Reflecting back to the, the protagonist early on, Mr. Dorsey, in that introductory story, remember the guy that wrote the, the psalm, that wonderful psalm? I just found out this morning it's not in the Adventist hymnal because I was going to have you guys open it, but I talked to Sister Roma. She, saw, she knew the song right away. She said, oh, yeah, yeah, but you won't find it in the hymnal. It's in the Baptist hymnal. I said, oh, I can't use that. I can't have you guys turn to it. But as I reflect back to Mr. Dorsey, I see a man, a friend, hurting, feeling let down, abandoned, betrayed by his friend. I trusted you and my wife and my son are gone. But what I see next after two weeks of him being depressed and despondent and upset, I see God using the very gift that he gave him to reach him with words because he said the words just came to him. The words in the mouth didn't just come to him. God's spirit reached him where he was. He didn't say, when you get yourself together, I'll come back. When you, when you stop being angry at me, when you stop blaming me, I'll come back and see you. No, God knew what he needed. And he gave him a song that at the time contemporaneously helped him get through. And you know how many people that song has blessed? That's what he did. While being blamed incorrectly for death and separation, that's not who God is. While being blamed for that, he reached out and said, let me hug you. Let me love you. Do we do that? I don't enough. I don't enough. Dorsey's friend Jesus communicated to him through his own gift that he gave him. Precious Lord, take my hand. That's what he needed. Your daughter, your son's gone. Your wife's gone. But Thomas, I'm still here. Take my hand. Don't try to solve it. Don't try to rationalize it. Don't try to figure it out. Just talk to me. Just talk to me. Turn with me back to our text uh, scripture reading for today, Luke twenty two forty two. 42. Say so you shouldn't wear the saints out, some relative. I'm watching the clock. Luke twenty two forty two. 42. I want to bring it home. This is the time of year where people are focused on Christ. That's a good thing. It's appropriate. I'm going to read it here again. I'll start it. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll start all the way back at 39. Because what made me start thinking about this in earnest was the play, Sister Sharon, with the pastor getting his lines more and more correct every time. You know, pastor knows the Bible so well. Don't tell him I said that. He's probably watching. But he knows the Bible so well. In the beginning, he was doing his own lines, right? Because he knew the Bible. And Jason one day said, wait a minute. That's not right. <laughs> he didn't say his line. But in any case... Back to this, it got me to thinking about this. As he came out and went, as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, close by, and kneeled down and prayed, saying this, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I want to hold our thoughts there for a moment. I think it's appropriate today as we consider this weekend, we can either fight against it with a two-hour Bible study on the accuracy of dates and times and seasons, and if that's what you're supposed to do, praise God, or we can use the opportunity to share with people that there's a living God, and he has a beautiful doctrine of love. 
Man, it's so awesome. You Adventists got the best doctrine. Do you know that? It shows the character of God. It aligns with the Bible. We can take time with that, but get to know him. Get to tell him about your life. I mean, I notice things are closed down. I can't go to the gym no more. I'm like, what? Your gym, you're closing the gym? But that's not why I could, I could have a sermon say, but you know, that's really not probably when Jesus rose, <laughs> right? Or I can say, hey, you know, our church is, we're, we're celebrating the life of Christ every day. We'll do it on this Sabbath. Why don't you come on by? It's my choice, right? I can, sometimes, frankly, I've chose the other route. Let's be honest with you. Be honest with you. But I think it's appropriate as we consider this weekend the world's focus on a sacrifice and save Jesus that we kind of use our lives to preach the sermon. Be careful with our words. Be very careful. So I noticed after the prayer, if we were to go on and read in Luke twenty two forty two, 42, an angel came to Jesus. So, uh, and strengthen him, the word says. Um, a lot of people think, commentary bears out, that it was Gabriel came and strengthened him. So he was about to, I think back, um, eternity pass. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, they commune. We're going to create man at some point. They might go astray. We need a plan. We got to bring them back. So Jesus says, I'll go. Well, that theology is okay because John says that Jesus was a lamb slain from when? Found, day before the foundation of the earth, right? So we can, that theology is okay. So that's what happens. He says, okay, we're going to do that. Jesus decides to go that route. He says, I'm, I'll do it. He comes down. The plan is time to implement the plan. And this came clear for me through the pray, play, Sister Sharon, as I watched it over and over and over again. The pastor laboring through his parts. Jesus praying. His friends, just, they just, just they deserted him. His friends wouldn't talk to him. They wouldn't pray with him. Can you just pray with me for a little while, he said? They sleeping. Some of y'all were snoring. It was really, I got it. But it, it made me think, man, he had to go to the Father. And he said, man, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be separated from you. I've been with you forever. But I'm going to do it because I love him. And you love him. And we love him. So the commentary says there was a point of decision. The commentary said he had to decide, will I do this? He didn't just pray a minute and get up. He was sweating at, point, at one point, blood. He said, I'm going to do it on their behalf. That's what this season is about. He did it for you and I. He did it for us. He loved us so much, he made the decision. But at his most difficult time, which led to a great victory for us, he sought out his father in prayer. Wasn't the first time. They had been doing it all along. But he sought out the Father of prayer. So I would say to you, brothers and sisters, I don't know exactly where you are today, and I don't need to know. It's okay, God knows. I don't know what potentially troubles you. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what the challenges are. I know there's a God who cares. I know He's living. The Bible says He's with the Father on the right hand, He's interceding on our behalf. The Bible makes that clear. I don't know when he rose. I can't go to some calendar and figure out all the dates. I don't know that. What do I know? I know that the Bible says he came to be with us. Emmanuel. They shall call him Emmanuel. God will be with you. He tabernacles with us. He's living. He had a living ministry. He died on our behalf. That's what I know for sure. I'm not smart enough to figure everything else out. So I say to you while we're focusing on this time, other people are let our lives, let our words, let our interactions show and emulate the character of Christ. So two quick things and we'll close. One is just prayer requests. I'll say, um, I'll say an appeal. If you didn't know, because you might not, that God loves you so much and you're hearing this for the first time, that's okay. It's all right. I heard it for the first time. Everybody here heard it for the first time or if you're hearing it more clearly for the first time and you want an elder to pray for you I'm going to put him on the spot Elder Jones if you can come up uh, if you want an elder to pray for you then I'm going to ask that you come up if second request because I'm going to group them all together so nobody has to stand out if you just want to pray for a deeper walk with Christ and don't get up because you're going to make me feel good I'm going to feel okay either way 
It's just what God asked me to do, so I'm doing it. If you want to come up and ask for a walk, closer walk with God, I'm going to ask you to do that. We're not writing your names down. We're not putting your names on the books. None of that. If you want that, we'll do it. But I just want to afford you the opportunity. So two requests. You're hearing it for the first time. You want to come up where you want a closer walk with Christ. I'm going to ask Elder Jones to pray for us. And come on up if you want. and We'll have that prayer. Anybody? For the rest of us, let's stand. Brother, we pray for everyone. Let us pray. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we recognize your resurrection this weekend. Your love for us. So much that you would give your life and sacrifice yourself so that we can reconcile with you doesn't matter what we've done doesn't matter where we've been doesn't matter how we get here father it's because of you our relationship with you now that we can call you father friend brother And because you sacrificed yourself for us, Lord, we've established this, this new covenant. Thank you, Jesus, for making that decision for us. Lord, now there is no sin that can separate us from you. Lord, you are willing and able to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all righteous unrighteousness. Lord, we pray for those that have heard this word for the first time, Lord. We pray that you would give them peace of mind, understanding, so much that they give their life to you today. And Lord, we pray for those that have been in the church a long time. We pray, Lord, that you would give us a renewedness of strength. Let us lean on you in times of difficulty and in times of praise. Thank you, Jesus, for another day and another opportunity to worship you and to give our lives to you. We ask it. Not by anything that we have done. Only because of your sacrifice. Of your life. That you gave your blood for us. As a remission of sins. In his name we pray. Let all God's people say in one voice. Amen. And amen. There will be an elder who will be sitting right here to my left, your right. Uh, He's always there for prayer to be Brother Larry today, Elder Larry. So if you want to pray, if you want to talk to him, if you want to share something with him, he'll be there. So please be aware of that. Happy Sabbath, church family. I hope you all feel as blessed as I do this afternoon. Um, We're going to start our... Worshiping giving with a verse found in Luke 12, verse 34. And it says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. By paying tithe and offering, we show the value of the place on spreading the gospel and our love for God. In essence, we are saying, I would rather place my treasure in heaven than have riches in this world. This offering is going to the North American Division Evangelism. Will the deacons please stand? 
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you on the Sabbath day in your house to come to you with our open hearts, Lord, and um, we ask you to help us to open our hearts and hands in praise and gratitude to you so that we may carry your will, Lord, and in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. amen. Standing, our closing hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer.
478, 478. certain and sure that Jesus rose again on the third day and is now at your right hand making petition for us. We thank you for that, Lord. May our lives be a reflection of the sacrifice that was made. May we look forward to our prayer time every day, our communion with you one-on-one. -on -one. And may we anxiously look forward to the time where we can be with you face to face and you will wipe away that last tear. And our hour of prayer will be sweeter than that is with you. Bless each member and each person here today. And may their lives be full of your spirit, your love, your kindness. And may they go doing your works with gladness and joy. Here's my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Please wait until the deacons usher you out. Happy Sabbath.